I just wanted to say good afternoon and really thank everyone for joining us on this live, uh, this live talk today. Uh, my name is Katie Strolson, and I'm glad you're here with us today on Yom HaShoah. I would also like to uh, thank Elise Shane Brown and Jamie Karras from the Holocaust Council through our Greater Metro West Federation for co-sponsoring this author with us today. And before I introduce Rebecca, I just want to mention that in case you're not aware, uh, JCC Metro West is offering live virtual programming, even though our doors are closed. You can find that schedule on our website at jccmetrowest.org. Um, and if you'd like to join our mailing list, just uh, send an email. We send out uh, daily email alerts with the schedule for the next day so that you could be in touch with what's going on. Um, Rebecca will be taking some uh, questions and comments after the after her talk. At the bottom, there's a chat button. If you have any questions, just put a question in. And at the end of the presentation, she is happy to uh, take your questions as they come in. Um, so now let me introduce Rebecca. And again, Rebecca, thank you for being flexible and for joining us on this Zoom call today. Rebecca Erbilding is the author of Rescue Board, the untold story of America's efforts to save the Jews of Europe, which won the National Jewish Book Award for excellence in writing based on archival research. She holds a PhD in American history from George Mason University and has been a historian, curator, and archivist at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum for the past 17 years. She served as the lead historian on the museum's current special exhibition, Americans and the Holocaust. So now, excitedly, I welcome Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to my, my patio in suburban Maryland. Um, I'm really sorry I'm not in northern New Jersey for so many reasons, uh, not the least of which that there's a pandemic going on and none of us can be together. Um, but it was really nice to kind of hear you chatting amongst yourselves before it, uh, we all started. It's kind of amazing the way that Zoom has taken over all of our lives in the past month and a half. And I'm, I'm really glad that so many people have learned to use it so that we could actually figure out how to do this virtually. Um, so I'm going to give kind of an abbreviated talk, um, largely because I think it's hard to stare at a screen for so long. Um, but I really want to take any question that you have, any burning question that you've ever had about the Roosevelt administration, about American response to the Holocaust. I'm going to talk about a really specific aspect of that history. Um, but I, I can answer questions, whatever question that you've had. Um, this is a topic that is a very emotional one, and it's a topic that a lot of people have a lot of questions about. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, I know that there are a number of you who are um, just on the phone. You're not going to miss much. Um, I have given book talks with and without pictures, so I will do my best to kind of describe what is on the screen, but, but don't feel like you're really missing out. Um, it's not that visual a presentation. Um, so my book Rescue Board um, begins on the first full weekend of August in 1942 in the Les Miles internment camp in southern France. Um, two Quaker aid workers, um, workers for the American French Service Committee, are in the camp. Um, on the right is Roswell McClelland in the photo that you can see. Um, in the summer of 1942, he's 28 years old. He had been born in California and he is in Les Mille and he's witnessing the first wave of deportations of foreign Jews from Les Mille north to Drancy, which is a camp outside of Paris. And from there, um, they will be sent to Auschwitz where most of them will be killed upon arrival. Um, Ross knows where these people are going, at least in very vague terms. Um, a week before uh, the deportations began in August, he had managed to get a meeting with Pierre Laval, who was the head of Nazi collaborating Southern France. And he had told Laval at this meeting that, that Laval needed to cancel the deportations. He could not let any of the foreign Jews be sent away from Southern France because he said that the Nazis had a plan to exterminate these people. That was the phrase he used in the summer of 1942. And um, Laval had kind of laughed at him. He had said, that's just a rumor. 
that is um, fiction that the Nazis are promising that they are just taking foreign Jews to special areas in, um, in Eastern Europe where they will be well cared for, special ethnic reservations. And anyway, Laval tells this American, um, if your country cares so much about the fate of the Jews, why haven't you taken them yet? So Rescue Board is a little bit about how we got to there, how US immigration policy had been structured since the 1920s, specifically, um, this is a picture of Les Miel for those of you who can see the screen. Immigration um, had been structured since the 1920s, specifically based in racism, um, based in the idea that some people are biologically better than others and that some countries produce better immigrants than others. And so they have this situation in the US in 1924 where we pick the countries that produce good immigrants and decide that they will get many more visas than the countries that produce so-called bad immigrants. And of course, the countries that produce bad immigrants are countries in Asia, countries in Africa, and countries in Eastern and Southern Europe, where Jews and Catholics and Slavs live. That law that, that chooses who the good immigrants are and the bad immigrants are, is in place until 1965. So it is the entire, you know, the US passes no new laws in the 1930s to let more Jews in and keep or keep Jews out. They don't have to because we have the 1924 law that did that just fine. Um, but there is a lot of information in 1933 and in the, throughout the 1930s about what the Nazis are planning to do to Jews and what they are currently doing to Jews. Um, this is, for those of you who can see it on the screen, this is a, a picture of the Newark Star Eagle on April 1st, 1933. Roosevelt has been in office for about three weeks. Hitler has been Chancellor of Germany for about two months. And you can see that the main headline says, Nazis enforce boycott edict, guards picket closed shops. They're reporting on the boycott of Jewish owned stores in Germany. And that is a bigger headline than the one directly below it, which says, speed New Jersey beer bill action, passage is expected Monday night. The end of prohibition and the beginning of beer sales. The boycott of Jewish stores is a bigger story than that. Um, and there is a lot of news coverage throughout the early, um, the early part of 1933, the spring and summer, um, news of the burning of books in Nazi Germany, news of prohibitions that are kicking Jews out of the civil service and, um, and boycotting shops. There's so much information actually in the United States that there are marches and rallies in at least 65 different cities not protesting the Great Depression, not protesting prohibition, um, but protesting what the Nazis are doing to German Jews. Um, this is a telegram to the State Department from the citizens of Bayonne, New Jersey, um, a few days before that boycott headline. Um, you can see it says, we the citizens of Bayonne, New Jersey, assembled on this 27th day of March in the junior high school, um, do unanimously and without regard to racial, religious, or political affiliation voice our indignant, indignant protest against the vicious acts and sinister designs of the government of Germany towards the Jews and other minorities in its midst. And we call upon our own government to convey to the government of Germany the opprobri opprobrium um, with which such acts and designs are regarded by the enlightened conscience of the American people. Hitler has been in power at this point for two months of the 12 years that he will rule. And there are, in the State Department's records, there are over 500 petitions from organizations throughout the United States, sometimes whole communities like this one in Bayonne, um, the, the Socialist Party of Maine, the Irish Painters Union. These are not just Jewish organizations. These are organizations of American citizens who are seeing what's in the news and are protesting what is happening. The problem with this is that Americans, uh, especially during the Great Depression, but, but I think consistently through American history, have a very short attention span. Um, we pay attention to what's happening in the news and then the news cycle changes and we, we kind of stop paying attention. And that's what happens in 1933. Um, Americans start to refocus on the New Deal and on economic recovery 
and we stop paying attention to what the Nazis are doing to Jews in Germany. So the protests die out after the protests around book burning. It comes up again a little bit as the United States debates whether to boycott the Olympics in Berlin in 1936. And it comes up again really with Kristallnacht. Um, Kristallnacht, the attacks on Jews in November 1938, um, are the longest and largest sustained newspaper coverage of any event related to the persecution of Jews. It is front page news in the United States for about three weeks. Um, what I'm showing on the screen now is the New York Star Eagle, um, and it says Nazis attack Jews and burn temples uh, as the big headline. And then the other big headline is the 1938 midterm elections. Um, Republican sweep is hailed as trend towards 1940 victory. Um, it is a massive story in the United States. Um, but the, again, the problem is that Americans by and large saw it as a problem but did not see themselves or the United States as part of the solution. In a, a series of polls a couple of weeks later after Kristallnacht, um, so this is the end of November 19, for, uh, 1938, Americans are asked, do you approve or disapprove of the Nazi treatment of Jews in Germany? And 94% of Americans disapprove of what the Nazis are doing. And then the same people are asked, should we allow a larger number of Jewish exiles from Germany to come to the United States to live? And 72% say no. And it's this gap between disapproving and being willing to be part of the solution that I think is, is kind of the summary of this entire period. Americans are sympathetic, but they are not willing to change our immigration policy. They are not willing by and large to allow more refugees in or to protest really strongly what the Nazis are doing. And so my story really becomes the story of a refugee crisis um, of hundreds of thousands of people trying desperately to get out of Europe and into the United States and the United States debating on whether or not to take them. Um, the refugee crisis extends past Pearl Harbor. There are still Jews in Casablanca, in Southern France and in Lisbon who are still desperately trying to get out. And so it then becomes the story of how there can be an aid worker, uh, an American in a concentration camp in 1942 who is watching deportations begin from the inside. Mainly though, my story is about what happens next because Roswell McClelland is not the only person working that first full weekend of August, 1942. Uh, Gerhard Rigner, who was a worker with the World Jewish Congress in Switzerland, um, has learned third hand from a German businessman that the Nazis have a plan. There had been reports of mass killing in Eastern Europe, but it was mainly the reports of this town has been wiped out, sources say. Um, sources from the Polish government in exile or the Soviet Union. And those were two sources that Americans largely didn't trust. They thought that could be just war propaganda. That could be trying to get our country, an isolationist nation, to try to fight harder if we think that the Nazis are murdering Jews en masse. And so it takes a really uncomfortably long time for Americans to understand that Nazi Germany not only has a plan, but is carrying out a plan to try to murder all of the Jews of Europe. And this is really the origin of how um, it comes to be acknowledged in the United States. So Rigner gets this information and he tries to send it to Stephen Wise, the most famous rabbi in America, friend or at least acquaintance of President Roosevelt's. And he's, he thinks to himself, well, if, if Stephen Wise has this information, knows that the Nazis are carrying this out, Wise will know what to do. Wise will go to Roosevelt. Um, the State Department in Washington actually blocks this information blocks the fact that the Nazis have a mass murder plan. Um, they say that it's a, just a war rumor. And one says, even if it's true, there's nothing we can do about it. So the news gets out anyway. Um, something, a story this big, something this big can't be kept secret for long. Um, and by the end of August 1942, um, Stephen Wise has received this information. And by November, um, the State Department has confirmed it. So I'm showing now a couple of articles. Um, one is entitled, Two Million Jews Slain, Rabbi Wise Asserts. 
So at the end of November 1942, it's actually reported in newspapers that the Nazis have what they call an extermination campaign, that they are planning to round up, deport, and murder all of the Jews of Europe. The problem is that November 1942 is the same month that the Allies land in North Africa. They are thousands of miles away from the extermination camps and the killing centers where most Jews are being murdered at this point. So the United States and the Soviet Union and the British decide that there's nothing they can do about it. There's no sense in trying to disrupt this plan. What they're going to do is they're going to issue a warning. They're going to say um, that we will hold war crimes trials after the war. So they condemn what they call the cold-blooded atrocities and they promise that we will hold war crimes trials after the war that will be how we deal with this problem. And so the year after this, 1943, is really a lost year. The United States knows that the Holocaust is happening, but is not making a concerted effort to do anything about it. Um, that is not true of the public. There are protests and marches. Um, there are, there's a pageant that tours the country and sells out Madison Square Garden twice in the same night. Um, calling on the U.S. government to do something about this, that this is happening, and even though we're fighting a war, we can divert some of our attention to trying to rescue Jews. Um, there's even an Orthodox rabbi's march on Washington in October 1943, again, asking the government, do something. Nobody's quite sure what, but do something about what is happening. Um, so, at this point, let me go back for a second. At this point in my story, um, a group of Treasury Department lawyers enter the picture, very unlikely heroes. Uh, they have spent most of the fall of 1943 fighting with the State Department, um, a State Department that they see as obstructionist and delaying humanitarian aid to Europe. So one uh, Treasury Department employee decides that he is going to write a memo detailing all of the ways in which the State Department has been obstructing humanitarian aid for Jews. Um, and he sneaks into the State Department file room in December 1943 and discovers that not only has the State Department been deliberately delaying humanitarian aid to Europe, but that one, um, the Assistant Secretary of State actually, had purposely instructed US diplomats in Switzerland to stop sending information about the Holocaust to the United States. That that um, information was trickling out to the activists. And he figured if the activists don't know what is happening in Europe, they won't protest us. So at this point in the story, like I said, the Treasury Department is there. And the Treasury Department is run by Henry Morgenthau Jr. Um, Morgenthau is the only Jewish cabinet secretary. He is a good friend of Roosevelt's. Um, he is not a financial guy at all, um, but he's a very, very good manager and a fantastic record keeper. You can go online now and you can read transcripts of almost all of his meetings for the entire 12 years that he is cabinet secretary. He had someone record all of his meetings. And so at the end of December 1943, um, Josiah Du Bois, um, a lawyer at the Treasury Department, in one of these meetings says, Mr. Secretary, the only question we have in our mind, I think, is the bull has to be taken by the horns in dealing with this Jewish issue and get this thing out of the State Department into some agency's hands that's willing to deal with it frontally. For instance, take the complaint, what are we going to do with the Jews? We let them die because we don't know what to do with them. And then Randolph Paul, who was the Treasury Department's general counsel, says, we are speaking as citizens now. And I always found that incredibly powerful, this idea that, that these Treasury Department lawyers are going to their boss, the cabinet secretary, and saying, this is not a policy position, this is not something that we think is even a politically good idea necessarily, but we are citizens in a democracy, and we're ashamed at what the State Department is doing and we think our country can do better. So armed with all of their evidence, um, they go to Roosevelt in January 1944 um, and they bring him a copy, this is an early draft, but they bring him a copy of a memo. Um, this copy is entitled, Personal Report to the President on the Acquiescence of This Government in the Murder of the Jewish Population of Europe. And it begins, 
one of the greatest crimes in history, the slaughter of the Jewish people in Europe is continuing unabated. And then ends with, unless remedial steps of a drastic nature are taken and taken immediately, I am certain that no effective action will be taken by this government to prevent the complete extermination of the Jews in German controlled Europe. And that this government will have to share for all time responsibility for this extermination. So they go to Roosevelt with all of the information that they've gathered about the State Department, all of the ideas that they have of the ways that the US government could try to rescue Jews. And in January 1944, they convince Roosevelt to issue an executive order, um, taking, this, taking matters related to refugees, as they called them, um, away from the State Department and giving it to a new government agency called the War Refugee Board. Um, the War Refugee Board is officially headed by the Secretaries of War, State, and Treasury, um, but it is almost entirely a Treasury Department operation. Henry Morgenthau stays really intimately involved with what the board is doing, um, and it is headed by John Paley, um, a 35-year-old head of Foreign Funds Control, which was the organization within the Treasury Department that held about $8 billion of seized Nazi assets. Uh, during the war. So he had a very important job and moves over to take charge of this new effort by the United States to try to rescue Jews in Europe. Um, by the end of the war, 17 months later, they have saved tens of thousands of lives. Um, at this point, um, most people ask, well, if this is true, uh, why haven't we ever heard of the War Refugee Board? Um, most people, I think, when I go out and speak, think that or have heard that either the United States knew nothing about what was happening during the Holocaust until liberation. Um, and even if they had known, they didn't do anything about it, or they knew everything from the beginning and didn't do anything about it. And the reality is it's, it's more complicated than that. Americans don't speak with one voice on any issue. There are people screaming from the rooftops, like I said, in 1933, that something terrible is happening in Germany. Um, but Americans' interests ebb and flow, the, the depression has a role, the war has a role, and by the end of the war, there is actually a change, a fundamental change in American policy from having no policy related to the Holocaust, it is not our problem, to having a proactive policy of rescue that tries and does save lives in the last year of the war. So my book, Rescue Board, is one of the first books on this topic. It's actually the first book solely on the War Refugee Board, who they were and what they did and what they tried to do. Um, you can see if you're if you have the screen on, um, these are, is just a pile of books about American response to the Holocaust. And you can see from some of the titles, um, some of the other ways that people have talked about this history, why we watched accomplices, Churchill, Roosevelt and the Holocaust, the abandonment of the Jews, the Jews were expendable. Um, these books tell larger stories. They tell the story from 1933 to 1945. And I really focus a little bit on the beginning, but mostly on the war years and on um, the War Refugee Board. Um, but they also tend to parrot each other. One historian will write a book and the other historian will cite that historian, that first historian, and another historian will cite the second historian. And so it becomes a game of historian telephone. And nobody had really gone back to the beginning and looked at the sources again, looked at what the actual documents from the time were telling. Um, these books kind of, I think, contribute to our memory of this period as one of unbroken anti-Semitism and indifference. Um, many of them have this kind of narrative of the United States abandoning the Jews, and then there'll be two paragraphs or two chapters at the end that say, oh, but there was this war refugee board and they saved lots of lives, but it was too little and too late to do any good. And so when I, when I was thinking about what I wanted to work on and what I wanted to write about, I thought, well, that's really interesting. This idea that there actually is a change in the United States. How did that change happen? Who were the people involved? Was this just a nine to five job for them or were they really dedicated? What did they know about what was happening and when did they know it? And so when I started to dive in, I realized that there's another much more fundamental reason why nobody's really looked at the War Refugee Board. 
um, and that is the, the records of the board itself. Um, the records of this organization are all up at the FDR library. Um, they're in, it's about 120 boxes of, of documents and files. And they're in two basic groups. Um, you have the correspondence material and you have the projects material. Um, the correspondence material is alphabetical, um, either by a person's last name or the organization that they worked for. And the projects file is on the topic that they're talking about. And so it all really depended on what the secretary thought that day as to where she filed something. And they, it was all she's, but where she filed something. So you could, it could be anywhere. And a lot of the historians who had written about this only looked at the projects parts, only looked at a few boxes of the projects parts. And they would write a book saying, here's what they, the War Refugee Board did in Turkey. Here's what they did in Switzerland. Here's what they did in Sweden. And so they ignored all of the correspondence parts and everything that didn't kind of, wasn't easily understood by them. So I knew from the beginning that I was going to have to look at everything. And so I spent about two years taking photographs of every single document in all 120 boxes. Um, I organized them based on the organization of the records. And then I realized that chronology matters, that it matters, you know, when you organize something by last name or by organization, it kind of flattens everything. You don't know when that letter was written. Um, and so you can't tell from box to box how they're making decisions. I even found some telegrams where part of the telegram about one topic was in one box and then the rest of the telegram was about 30 boxes later um, somewhere else. So I needed to figure out a way to organize it so that I could read things in order, in chronological order, the same way that the War Refugee Board would have received something or written something. Um, and so I came up with this kind of elaborate um, titling structure um, if you can see this, there's a, a very long file name, um, and it starts with a six digit number, 440621. When you start a file with that number, that indicates to me that that is a document that was written in 1944, June the 21st, 440621. And then the rest of the file name is where I found it in the record. And so I ended up with about 43,000 PDFs, um, 43,000 different documents from the War Refugee Board collection, from collections from family members of people who worked for the board, um, all of these different collections. And I, by the time I was done, um, sorted the entire collection chronologically. No matter what archive I found it in, no matter where I found it in the collection, um, I titled everything chronologically. Uh, so that it would sort chronologically. Um, I could see the document, the photographs that I took of the document, I could take notes, um, and all of it is searchable. So I could say definitively, without um, question, this was the first time that they heard about this information and this is how they reacted to it. I know that it's, I'm sorry, it's kind of hard to explain um, and also very hard for those of you on the phone. So I'm going to skip ahead and talk a little bit about what the War Refugee Board did um, once they were created, how they tried to save lives. So the very first thing they do, actually, is that they streamlined the ways in which organizations could send humanitarian aid to Europe. That was kind of the number one thing that people needed, where they needed food, they needed medicine, they needed clothing um, in areas like Transnistria, uh, in Romania, um, where people were starving to death and freezing and you could still get some aid to them. So by the end of the war, the War Refugee Board has figured out a way to send about $11 million in humanitarian aid to Europe, which is the equivalent of about $154 million today. And that aid was used to buy guns for the French underground. It was used to um, pay for food for children in hiding. It was used to create false papers so that Jews could live um, posing as Christians, um, and it was used as payment for guides who were helping Jews sneak over the border to countries of safety like Spain or Switzerland. Um, from Washington, John Paley, the, the head of the board, who you can see if you're looking at your screen, you can see him on the right. 
he tried to lay out his strategy. Um, he and his organization would try to um, keep Jews alive as long as possible, um, either by moving people out of Nazi territory, if, if somebody was on um, a country that bordered a neutral country or a free country, uh, if you were in a place like Romania or Bulgaria or France, if there was a way to get you over the border into some area of safety, they were going to try to do that. Um, if there was a way to persuade the Nazis to stop killing, they were going to try that. Um, if there was a, and then for people who were deep inside Nazi territory in Poland, in um, Hungary, in Germany, they were going to try to keep people alive as long as possible. Their goal was to keep you alive long enough so that you could be liberated by the armies. Um, so I'm gonna give you just a quick example of, of each one. Um, one of the first things that they do, like I said, is they're trying to convince the Nazis to stop, which is no easy task. Um, and so they launch a propaganda warfare campaign. They drop leaflets, they send radio broadcasts into Nazi territory, um, warning people of post-war justice, warning people that we would have war crimes trials after the war, that the allies look likely to win the war. And so why would you become a war criminal? Um, on March 24th, 1944, FDR issues a statement that is written by the War Refugee Board. Um, it starts a lot like the, the memo to them or to him had started that the board wrote before they were created. Um, in one of the blackest crimes of all history, begun by the Nazis in the day of peace and multiplied by them a hundred times in time of war, the wholesale systematic murder of the Jews of Europe goes on unabated every hour. This date, March 24th, um, the month anyway, March, is, is a very important period um, when you're looking at the Holocaust because March 1944 is when the Nazis invaded Hungary. Hungary was the largest and last mostly intact Jewish population in Europe. There are about 800,000 Jews in Hungary, um, 600,000 Hungarian Jews and 200,000 people who had found safety or what they hoped would be safety in Hungary. Um, in fact, the very first piece of humanitarian aid that the War Refugee Board helps with after they're created is $100,000 to send to Poland to help Jews escape into Hungary. So when the War Refugee Board learns that the Nazis have invaded Hungary and that they're immediately starting to, to um, round up Jews, send them into ghettos and then deport them into camps, they panic. Um, they quickly add a paragraph to Roosevelt's statement specifically aimed at Hungarians, saying, you have not been a war criminal yet. Um, why you, member of Hungarian police, why you, um, why would you do this to yourself now? Why are you going to collaborate with the Nazis when it's already 1944 and the Allies are going to win? Um, we can't measure the effects of this kind of psychological warfare. That's one of the challenges of it. Um, but I did find this um, pamphlet that you can see if you're looking on your screen, you can see it. Um, this is actually the leaflet that was dropped over Germany. And I was alerted to it when I met an elderly German man who remembered um, receiving it. He remembered finding it in a potato field. Um, as a teenager in Germany in the spring of 1944. And Allied propaganda was really smart. So on the, on the back side of this warning, there were reports of local bombing raids. Um, and so you on the ground knew, yes, the, the Allies did bomb this factory in the town near mine. Um, and so he says that this is how he learned about the Holocaust and he believed what he was reading. Um, the U.S. government, through the War Refugee Board, also laundered money to help refugees sneak into Sweden. Um, I have spoken a couple of times at the Treasury Department at this point. They love this story. Um, they are the heroes of this story. And the last time I did it, was, it was a public lecture. And the Treasury Department said, well, maybe this time, maybe don't call it money laundering. Maybe you could call it secret money transfers. Um, and to me, it's the same thing. And so I will tell you the story and then you can decide whether there was money laundering or secret money transfers um, going on. So this is Ivor Olson, if you can see him on your screen. He's a, a happy looking man in a bow tie. 
Um, he was the, the Treasury Department's financial attache to the Stockholm legis, uh, legation. He had arrived in December 1943, and his job sounds very boring, except that he is actually an OSS spy, um, the precursor to the CIA. His code name was Crispin, and he was in charge of monitoring the movement of money and war material between Nazi Germany and Sweden. So he has a very important job, and among other things, he will um, he is the person who um, selects Raoul Wallenberg, the now famous Swedish businessman who goes to Hungary in the spring of 1944, or in the summer of 1944, and rescues Jews by posing as a diplomat. Um, the War Refugee Board had been putting pressure on most of the neutral countries, on Switzerland, Sweden, Spain, Portugal, and Turkey, to do more, um, to pass on information about what their diplomats were seeing in Nazi territory, especially Hungary. And after the Nazis invade Hungary, they asked all of these countries, will you send more diplomats into Hungary? Will you spread them throughout the country? Maybe they can pass on intelligence. Maybe they can act as witnesses or as deterrence to violence. Um, only Sweden said yes, and Sweden said, pick who you want to send. Uh, so Ivor Olsen picked Raoul Wallenberg, who worked in the same office building that, that Olsen did. And as many of you know, Wallenberg goes to Budapest, he issues safe papers, he establishes safe houses, um, he saves probably tens of thousands of lives, along with other diplomats at the time. Um, that is not the money laundering story. So for much of the summer of 1943, Olsen is trying to get Jews out of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia by water. Um, he says that he needs speedboats and guns. He needs the money to buy speedboats and guns, which he will then give to different partisan groups um, representing each country, one for Lithuania, one for Latvia, and one for Estonia. Um, and they will take the boats, they will land on the beaches of these countries, and they will try to convince Jews and other refugees to board the boats and then land on the islands off the coast of Sweden. Um, the US government doesn't want the Swedish government to know that we are funding unregulated refugee entry into their country. And they also don't want Swedish Jews to know. Um, Olsen reports from Stockholm that Swedish Jews are very interested in trying to help as long as it doesn't involve bringing any refugees into Sweden. So the US government um, contacts the staff at Goodyear Tire and decides that they will put, the War Refugee Board will put $50,000 on the books of Goodyear Tire in Akron, Ohio. And in exchange, um, the Goodyear Tire factory in Norrköping, Sweden will give $50,000 worth of Swedish kroner to Ivor Olsen. That way, the money transfer would never officially be on the books, um, and no one in the Swedish government uh, will know that Ivor Olsen is getting this money to fund the refugees' arrival. Um, this has been entirely removed from any of the War Refugee Board's boxes. It, it does not exist. There's no reference to it in any of the 120 boxes I looked at. So it is almost certainly uh, certain that they scrubbed the records, that they took out all of the references. Um, but they forgot to scrub Henry Morgenthau's papers. Um, Morgenthau, like I said, was an excellent record keeper. So in this cable from June 1944, it says, this arrangement worked well, and although not foolproof, it's desirable from a security point of view. At this time, we don't recommend bank transfers as receipt of cable transfers of such size by individuals unavoidably attract notice and suspicion. Um, they get about 4,000 refugees out of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia that summer of 1944. Um, very few of them are Jewish, largely because the Jewish communities of those countries are, are gone. And the few Jews who remain in those countries um, are mostly in hiding and are very nervous, understandably so, about emerging from hiding, trying to make it to a beach and then boarding a speedboat to go to Switzerland or to go to Sweden um, when the Soviets are about to come in and liberate the country. So the people who are escaping, it's hard to know whether they're escaping actually the Nazis or the Soviets. And the War Refugee Board staff didn't ask very many questions. In Switzerland, um, they needed somebody on the inside. Switzerland had been surrounded by enemy territory for years. 
And so the War Refugee Board needed to find an American who was inside Switzerland already um, to act as their representative within Switzerland. And they find Roswell McClelland, the same Quaker aid worker who had witnessed deportations uh, in France in 1942. Um, in the fall of 1942, he had escaped with his pregnant wife across the border to Switzerland right before the Nazis took over southern France. And he decided with his wife that they would just wait out the war. Um, they would have their son. Uh, they ended up having another son while they were there. And they would just um, distribute some aid in Switzerland, but otherwise live a quiet life. And then the War Refugee Board was created. And Roswell McClelland, who's now 30 years old, was recruited to be the representative. Um, he has one of the busier jobs in the whole War Refugee Board because there's so many different underground groups coming in and out of Switzerland. Um, among other things, among many other things, he starts participating in ransom negotiations with the Nazis. The Nazis are looking around and seeing the same um, kind of playing field as everybody else. They're seeing that the allies are likely going to win the war. And so some Nazis think, well, maybe we can get something for what the, what the Americans care about. They say they care about Jews, maybe we will offer Jews for sale. So the first offer was um, Jews in exchange for 10,000 trucks, which the Nazis promised they would only use on the Eastern Front against the Soviet Union and not on the Western Front against Great Britain or America. Um, the United States is never going to pay ransom, but McClelland and Sally Meyer, um, who is the Joints representative in Switzerland, managed to string along a group of high-ranking Nazis for seven months, promising that the United States is going to pay ransom, that we just need a little more information, we need a few more details about the kind of trucks they want, the kind of medical supplies they want, and we will give them what they need. Um, in November 1944, McClellan even goes to Zurich to one of the very fancy hotels in the banking district, and he meets in the basement of the hotel with Oberstrom von Freer Kurt Becker, who works directly for Adolf Eichmann. And McClellan poses as President Roosevelt's personal emissary on the part, um, showing the president's personal interest um, on the ransom negotiations. Um, McClellan doesn't tell anybody in Washington that he's done this. It doesn't come out until after the war was over. Um, but during the war, an American aid worker meets with a high-ranking Nazi official specifically to negotiate on humanitarian matters. And as a result of that meeting, McClellan and Sally Meyer get um, more than 1,600 Jews out of Bergen-Belsen as a good faith gesture on the part of the Nazis. Beyond all of this, um, the War Refugee Board opens a refugee camp in upstate New York, in Oswego. Um, they bring nearly a thousand mostly Jewish refugees to live there. Um, arguing that the United States can't be hypocrites, that we can't be asking other countries to take Jews over their borders if we're not willing to take any of our own. Um, they send 300,000 food packages into concentration camps in the final weeks of the war. So if you've ever heard a survivor give testimony about receiving a food package towards the end of the war, it was almost certainly packed on Long Island, shipped across the Atlantic, disguised as a Red Cross food package, and delivered to Dachau, Sachsenhausen, Ravensbrück, Buchenwald in the final weeks of World War II and paid for by the US government. They pass on requests to the War Department to bomb the rail lines, the gas chambers, and the crematoria leading to Auschwitz. Um, the War Department consistently says this is not their priority. They are not interested in doing this. Um, in November 1944, the War Refugee Board gets a report about Auschwitz. It was written by two escapees from Auschwitz, and it details in very graphic detail um, the process of arrival and selection and gassing at Auschwitz, the number of people who had been killed there. And so the War Refugee Board passes this on to the War Department and says, we need to bomb this place. This place needs to be destroyed. And the War Department again says, this is not our priority. We are not interested in doing this. So the War Refugee Board releases this to the press. They said, without asking permission of anyone else in the US government, they send this Auschwitz report out to 200 different newspapers. And it is front page news in November, 1944. 
that there is this place called Auschwitz and that millions of Jews are being gassed there. Um, this is the Louisville Courier, um, Thanksgiving weekend, 1944. You can see that they've made the font very small um, to, sh to try to fit as much information from the report into the hands of their readers. Um, a week after this um, newspaper blitzed, the, like it was front page news throughout the country. Um, and a week after that, the Washington Post editorial staff published an editorial entitled Genocide. It was the very first time that word was used in an American newspaper. And the editorial writers say, the War Refugee Board has introduced, through, through telling us about Auschwitz, the American uh, War Refugee Board has introduced us to a new crime and that Americans need to now learn the word for this crime. Um, in conclusion, um, the War Refugee Board's creation was and remains the only time that the US government ever tried to do anything about this. Um, the only time in American history that the US government founds an agency dedicated to trying to save the lives of the victims of our wartime enemy. Um, there are efforts after the war for different groups of refugees, for displaced persons, for Hungarians after the Hungarian Revolution, for Indo-Chinese in the 1970s, for Cubans in the 1960s, and then we finally get a comprehensive refugee law in 1980 for the first time. Um, but there's no cynical secondary motive to the War Refugee Board. There's nothing about the Cold War. There's no... Um, they're not aiding people because we're interested in what they can provide for us or for our country. Um, the refugees are not intended to become Americans. Um, most Americans still don't want to increase immigration after the war. Um, but, and most, most of the survivors never have any knowledge that the Americans had any interest in their survival. They don't know that the War Refugee Board existed. Um, Yehuda Bauer, who is the histori or historian emeritus at Yad Vashem, wrote once, what made the War Refugee Board such a unique body is that, is that it was officially permitted to break practically every important law of a nation at war in the name of outraged humanity. And so my goal um, with the book and with trying to share their story is to say that it's really relevant history that the work of the War Refugee Board and the questions that they were asking are still questions that we ask today. So they were debating at the time um, the role of ransom negotiations to save innocent victims. Um, how do we weigh how much can fall into the hands of our enemies if we're trying to distribute aid? How do we weigh, you know, spending money to aid a lot of people or rescue a few people? Um, how do you bring refugees into a country when there are very real national security concerns? All of these things the War Refugee Board was debating back then. And there are things that we continue to debate today, but we debate them as if it's the first time we've ever done it, that this is a new thing for our country. And it's not. We can go back to um, World War II and see the origins of some of these discussions. And so while the United States could and should have done so much more to try to rescue Jews during the Holocaust, especially in the 1930s when the war wasn't happening yet and there was an opportunity to expand our immigration. Um, what the War Refugee Board staff did during the war mattered. It saved a lot of lives. And we need to remember both to honor their efforts and to study them as we continue to um, debate similar questions today. So I am going to now stop sharing my screen um, and look at the chat um, and see uh, some of the questions. So yes, interesting that FDR gets a bad rap for not responding to the plight of Europe's Jews, yet he establishes a committee like this. It's 1944 when he does it. Um, he is involved in the War Refugee Board to the extent that he creates it, and there are a couple of things that they ask of him. Um, they go to him and they ask if he will issue the statement which they write, and he says, yes, that's fine. And they um, ask his help in establishing the refugee camp at Fort Ontario. Largely, he's not involved, though, for a couple of reasons. One is it's 1944 and the war is ongoing. Um, and I would argue, and a lot of historians have started to argue, 
that he is actively dying at this point. He has serious cardiovascular disease. And in March 1944, he's actually only working a couple of hours a day. Um, he has a, a cardiac surgeon with him almost 24 hours a day. Um, he is physically really not doing well and not paying attention to a lot of things. And so a lot of times when they ask something of him, it slips his mind or slips off his desk for a few weeks and they have to keep prodding him to get the president's interest involved. Um, is Cordell Hall viewed as an anti-Semite? Um, Cordell Hall, there were many rumors um, at the time, and I think it's true that his wife was Jewish, uh, which is interesting, but she was not practicing. He is a, a former congressman um, from Tennessee. Uh, he is not a, a diplomat at all. Um, he was kind of brought in because Roosevelt needed the attention of Southern Democrats and needed, you know, someone to kind of, it was a political appointment. Um, the problem was that Cordell Hull was a terrible manager and did not pay attention to any of the people who were brought into his department or what they were doing. So at one point in December 1943, um, as the Treasury Department is complaining about all of the things that the State Department is, is doing and not doing, um, Cordell Hall, it becomes clear at a meeting that Cordell Hall did not know the head of the visa division, the person in charge of immigration at all, who had been in place for years, and Cordell Hall had never met this person. <laughs> so during a refugee crisis, the Secretary of State is uninterested in how immigration is working and who is coming in and who is not. Um, so he, uh, he was not the person that you would look to for any of this. Um, thankfully, um, Roosevelt appoints Edward Statinius as the Under Secretary of State. He was only there a very short period of time, but Statinius was um, a much more um, avid supporter of the War Refugee Board, and they also managed to sideline Breckenridge Long, the Assistant Secretary of State. Um, he gets sidelined in January 1943, so they get so much more support from the State Department after the War Refugee Board is created. Um, Yes, the presentation, uh, Katie said, would be available online. Oh, good, that's already been asked. Um, how much did Her Henry Ford influence our effort or lack thereof in helping Jews? Um, I would say that Henry Ford is a big influence in the 1920s. Um, that is when he, his Dear Dearborn Independent, his newspaper is publishing the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. So he is um, an influence on our lack of willingness to accept immigration to the extent that he is fueling a lot of the anti-Semitism in the 1920s that leads to that 1924 law that is discriminatory against Jews and Catholics and Slavs. Um, he is influential in the rise of the second Ku Klux Klan, even though he's not a Klan member himself. He is part of that kind of atmosphere of hatred in the US in the 1920s. Um, and I, I think that's where he is, he plays a much more major role. Um, where is Churchill in all this? Churchill is kind of similar to Roosevelt. Um, he is a little more vocal about what is happening to Jews. Um, he makes a, a speech in 1941 um, after getting reports about Einsatzgruppen killings in Eastern Europe he makes a speech about this being a crime without a name. And as a response to that speech, um, his intelligence officers stop sharing information with him about what the Einsatzgruppen is doing. Um, they're worried that if the prime minister is talking openly about the Holocaust and openly about the extermination of Jews, it will show that we've broken the codes. <laughs> um, and so they, they stop sharing things with Churchill. Um, Churchill gets asked about bombing Auschwitz as well, and he is much more in favor of it um, than the War Department. There's no evidence Roosevelt is ever asked about bombing the, the camps, um, but Churchill is, and Churchill is much more interested, but he says, he, he looks into it and some of his people look into it and his people decide it's a question for the Americans. The Americans have a better, um, better range with their planes and they should do this. And then of course the Americans choose not to. Um, 
It sounds like the War Department short-circuited any request the Jewish community had to bomb the concentration campsites. Yes, they did. Was there anything more that Roosevelt could have done by playing or playing the Roosevelt card? <sighs> Maybe. Um, the, the thing is, the, the Treasury Department believed the War Department. Um, the War Department, it, the question first gets to the War Department in June 1944. And at that time, they say, we're busy. And it's June 1944. So the Treasury Department says, okay, they're, they're busy. You know, we've just landed on D-Day. If the War Department says they don't have the planes or the manpower to do it, we will believe them. Um, and then it comes up again in August and the, the War Department says, we're still busy. Okay, well, they're breaking out. They're about to take Paris. Maybe that's true. By November, the War Refugee Board has learned, one, a lot more about Auschwitz. They now have this report. And two, they're, they are a lot um, less willing to listen to the War Department's complaints that they're too busy. Um, it seems to the War Refugee Board, we've established our bases in Italy. They're not just up and running, they are full-fledged on. We are taking Italy. Um, there's no reason that we couldn't do this. And that's when they um, decide to issue the thing, the, the um, Auschwitz report to the press. Now Auschwitz is then evacuated and then liberated in January. Um, by November, I don't know what whether it would have done a lot of good by the time that the question gets to the War Department in January and the War Refugee Board is really pushing them to bomb, um, the gas chambers at Auschwitz have already shut down. They're starting to move some of the components from the gas chambers into Germany in the hopes of setting up new gas chambers in Germany, something that never happens. Um, but had we bombed, it would have been a statement for sure, a moral statement that we know that this is happening and we're trying to do something about it, but it wouldn't necessarily in November have disrupted mass murder at Auschwitz. Um, yes, Raphael Lemkin does coin the term genocide. He fights very hard for it. Um, and he sees that um, Washington Post article, which cites him as enormous vindication. He is trying very hard to get the crime of genocide recognized at Nuremberg. Um, Sylvia asks, is it true Roosevelt didn't wanna help the Jews? I get this question a lot. Um, Roosevelt is a politician. Eleanor is the humanitarian. Roosevelt, Franklin is the politician. And Franklin has two priorities during his presidency that override everything else. And I think if you, if you looked carefully, you, you would not find very much that disrupts those two priorities. Everything, nothing is more important than recovery from the depression and victory in the war. And if anything seemed to get in the way of that, he would not do it. And so when you have a population, especially in the late 1930s, that is overwhelmingly anti-immigrant, that is arguing that immigrants lead us into war, that they steal jobs, two arguments that were very convincing then, and you still see a lot of that same rhetoric today, um, that was not something Roosevelt was going to do when 80% of the population is anti-immigrant and you're getting that they take jobs during a depression and are pulling us into war when we're an isolationist nation. He is not interested in bucking that. Um, there's some evidence that he is privately sympathetic. He's at least sympathetic to what Eleanor wants to do. And Eleanor is very vocal in favor of admitting more refugees, particularly children. Um, he, is, he is willing to tolerate that with her um, and privately tells her, go ahead, but I'm not going to get involved. Um, Ruth Gruber is amazing. Um, I love Ruth Gruber. The question was, Ruth Gruber described being on the ship of refugees to Oswego. Did you learn about their lives in Oswego? Um, yeah, I'm actually, I, I'm, that's going to be my next book is the story of Oswego, uh, I think. Um, so the Ruth Gruber is amazing. She worked for the Department of the Interior and she originally went to Italy to board the ship of all of the refugees who were coming to live at the camp in upstate New York. And her job was to be kind of their press liaison. So she was going to board the ship, be with the refugees during the two week journey. And then when she arrived, she could tell the newspapers the story of these refugees. These were, this was what they had been, different refugees had been through. Um, to kind of 
make the case to the American people that these were people worth helping, that these were people who were escaping violence. And she ends up falling in love with them and they fall in love with her. And she becomes their liaison really for the entire time that they're in the camp. Um, she frequently travels up to Oswego and, and really gets involved in the lives of the refugees um, who, you know, get to the United States and, and have always heard that America is the land of the free and then are put in a camp in upstate New York behind barbed wire and are kept there until 1946. So the kids have very fond memories of attending school in the United States and playing with the, the kids of Oswego and the adults have a much, much harder time. Um, with that adjustment, of course. Um, let's see, I mentioned that thousands of Jews saved were saved during the activities. Did the negotiations about the truck save a specific number? They save at least 1,600. Um, that uh, was the number that are taken out of Bergen-Belsen and sent into Switzerland um, because the Americans demanded that the Nazis show that they meant this and that they had the power to release Jews. And so 1,600 Jews are taken out of Bergen-Belsen, um, part of them in August 1944 and the rest in December. Um, it's very, very hard to be precise about the figures. A lot of what the War Refugee Board is doing is working through other organizations, working through the Joint or the World Jewish Congress, um, people who have underground lines into occupied Nazi territory. Um, so David Wyman, who wrote the, the prize-winning book, The Abandonment of the Jews, said the War Refugee Board saved 200,000 lives. But he credits them with saving all of the Jews of Budapest, all of the Jews who survive in Budapest. Um, I think that's an overstatement. I think there are a lot of aid workers, um, diplomats for the neutral countries beyond Raoul Wallenberg, who were also issuing papers who had been doing it before the War Refugee Board was created. So I think that is an overstatement. I, I say tens of thousands, that's what the War Refugee Board said when they shut down, is that they had saved tens of thousands of lives and helped hundreds of thousands of people. And having been through all of their papers, I think that's the closest we're ever going to get to an exact number, is just tens of thousands. Um, can I draw comparisons between our current responses to refugees attempting to enter the US? Um, I think you can see some similarities of rhetoric between people who do not want immigrants or refugees back then and now, but there are also some differences. Um, back then, there is no U.S. refugee policy. Everyone is coming as an immigrant. Everyone has to go through the same system. There's only one way into the country, and it's through the immigration process. Um, there is no way to arrive as a migrant or seek asylum or come as a refugee. Um, that doesn't happen until after the war. So that is a key difference, um, is that we didn't have a refugee policy back then. Um, and we were unwilling to make any sort of exception for people who were fleeing persecution. You had to go through the same slow lines as everybody else. Um, I think it's disheartening when, when you hear rhetoric about immigrants or refugees as disease carriers or job stealers. I think that doesn't, um, there's no evidence that any of that is true and, and evidence of the opposite. Um, there's evidence that immigrants create more jobs than they, than they take. Um, and that was rhetoric that was used at the time and it was rhetoric that Jewish organizations in the late 1930s were trying to fight against as well. Um, the, the Joint writes a pamphlet entitled Refugee which you can find um, still online. It's, it's an amazing pamphlet. It's got um, statistics and little graphs and um, charts and cartoons about how immigrants create jobs. Um, and they had to put it out under the name of the Quakers. Uh, so the joint didn't, didn't admit that they had been the ones to write it because they thought, well, um, everyone's accusing Jews of, of being too much for immigrants. And so we'll let the Quakers um, issue it so that we're not accused of, of just trying to do something for Jews. Um, but there was a lot of, there was a lot of anti-Semitism and racism for sure involved and wrapped up in all of the anti-immigrant rhetoric too. And you see that today as well. Um, in my experience, are young people interested in learning more? Actually, yes. Um, my job at the Holocaust Museum now 
um, is that I am our historian for high school and middle school teachers. So I work um, trying, the way I describe it is I try to convince teachers that they can teach this, that they should teach this, and that they can do it um, in a way that is not just shocking their students, but getting them to ask really good, thoughtful questions and develop empathy. Um, that is my goal, that is our goal, um, and it, it is a really exciting job at a very challenging time um, when anti-Semitism is on the rise, but um, teachers overwhelmingly report that their students want more information about the Holocaust, that this is something they absolutely have so many questions about. Um, and so we are constantly developing new lessons and um, working with our partner organizations regionally, um, including in Metro West, um, to um, help teachers navigate not just COVID and trying to switch to an all digital presence, um, but how do you um, how do you teach kids about the Holocaust when it becomes increasingly difficult to bring a Holocaust survivor into the classroom? Um, so we are absolutely doing this. Um, how is the rescue board created? They're created technically by executive order from FDR, but it's after a lot of fighting within the State Department and the Treasury Department about who could control and who should control refugee matters and a lot of public pressure. Um, it doesn't happen without public pressure. It doesn't happen without rallies and marches, putting pressure on Congress and putting pressure on FER that um, the American people were interested and willing for their government to try to do something for Jews. Um, Varian Fry is fascinating guy. Um, he is not uh, that involved in the War Refugee Board. They tried to recruit him at one point to go to Spain. Um, but he was considered so far left politically. Um, there were rumors that he was a communist, he wasn't, but he was considered so far left politically that um, the War Refugee Board felt like they couldn't really deal with him um, and, and have it be something that was politically viable. Um, yes, and, and uh, if you know students who are interested in the American perspective, um, as, as Katie said at the beginning, the, the Holocaust Museum uh, special exhibit right now is called Americans in the Holocaust. I was the lead historian on that exhibit. Um, we're not obviously open to the public right now, but there is a really robust online exhibition that people can explore with lots of videos and um, footage and charts and graphs and interactives and, and photos to look at. So please um, let people know about that and, and go there. Um, so somebody said, could the people on the ship, the Lusitania, I think you mean the St. Louis. The Lusitania is World War I, but the St. Louis is World War II, um, or almost World War II. The St. Louis sails in the spring of 1939. Um, they are um, aiming at Cuba, the passengers. Um, almost all of the passengers on the St. Louis were Jewish. They were sailing from Germany and they were aiming to go to Cuba. They had Cuban landing permits. Um, many of them were on the waiting list to the United States, but had not yet gotten, none of them had gotten their US immigration visas. So they were planning to go wait in safety in Cuba and then proceed on to the United States. Um, when the boat lands in Cuba, the Cuban government refuses to honor their landing certificates. They say that they purchased them from a corrupt Cuban official um, who, the State Department at the time estimated had made a million dollars selling landing permits to Jews. Um, so they decided to invalidate all of the certificates that he had issued, which means that this, the St. Louis passengers were out of luck. The joint tries to negotiate to allow the passengers to land. Um, they offered the Cuban government the equivalent of two thirds of their annual budget if the Cuban government will allow the passengers in the St. Louis to land. Um, the Cuban government finally says no and orders them out of Cuban waters. Um, the passengers go up, try to convince the U.S. to let them in, but since the U they don't have immigration visas, um, the U.S. does not allow them in, Canada does not allow them in. Um, the joint then starts negotiating again with governments in Western Europe and convince the governments of the Netherlands, Belgium, France, and Great Britain to divvy up the passengers so that none of them have to go back to Germany. Um, at the time, the, the St. Louis is considered a success story. 
the passengers throw a party on board. There's a huge fundraising video that the joint makes about what a great job they did negotiating on behalf of the passengers of the St. Louis. But what we know now is that more than 500 of the refugees who ended up in Belgium, the Netherlands, and France are then under Nazi control again a year later, once Nazi Germany invades those countries. So, and about 200, uh, 254 of the passengers are murdered in the Holocaust. So it is a really complicated story, but it's also the only ship that is ever turned back from the United States. Um, if you had a US immigration visa, you could enter the United States. The US actually never officially closes its doors. Um, it just gets harder and harder and harder um, to escape for many reasons. And the US closes its, well, they never officially close its doors, but they, they make it much, much, much harder, particularly after World War II begins. And there's this fear of spies that color everything. I think that's all the questions and you have all patiently listened to me for over an hour. <laughs> and thank you very, very, very much. Well, Rebecca, thank you to you for coming and speaking to us on uh, today. Um, I think everyone was very engaged and interested in what you had to say, clearly an hour of, of listening and everyone's still excited and asking questions.